Hello everyone, Derek Barefoot back with you on the Typologetics YouTube channel with my wife May. We're continuing our study patterns of inspiration, 12 followed by 7 or 70 a, as a, a, a symbolic reinforcement of certain themes of the Bible. Let's open with prayer. Uh, Father, please guide our thoughts and provide us opportunities for spiritual sharing and helping of others through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. All right, so just to review briefly, 12 followed by 7, it's a pattern that emerges in the feedings Jesus did. 12 followed by 7 in Luke, it's not 12 followed by 7, it's 12 followed by 70, the two missions, the sending out of the 12, then the seven, sending out of the 70 or 72, but it's, uh, it's the same idea. We've seen it in Acts. Um, we uh, looked at, uh, in the Old Testament, Jacob's family, 12 sons, expanded to 70 sons plus grandsons at the time of going down into Gentile territory, into Egypt. In the book of Numbers, the 12 leaders, followed by the appointment of 70 elders because of a complaining that was uh, sort of fed or stoked by the non-Israelites among the Israelite con congregation that led to the appointment of the 70. Something like that happens in Acts. Uh, similarly, there's a complaint over food of different kind, but yet it does involve the Gentile uh, language speaking portion of the church. So we get not 70, but the appointment of seven. So as I said, you can think of uh, 70 as an expansion or amplification of seven, or you can think of seven as an abbreviation of the 70, but the idea is uh, that God begins with the family of Abraham and, and then moves outward to the Gentile world, also from small beginnings to a larger end result, uh, just to refresh our memories. And we uh, looked at an example in Daniel uh, before we looked at the, the table of nations, the 70 nations in Genesis, but we looked at this example in Daniel of something that happened in Nebuchadnezzar. I'd like to say a little more about that before we move on, that example. Let's turn back there just for a moment. Daniel chapter 4. So if you remember uh, last time, um, uh, May read the part of this where Nebuchadnezzar was deprived of his sanity, went out and ate grass, lost his uh, mental faculties, and had to be out with the beasts for seven years. Uh, but that was... 12 months after the word was spoken to him that he was on this path to uh, having a lesson taught to him by God. And I said at the time that uh, I think the indications are pretty clear that Nebuchadnezzar was being forced to undergo a version of the experience of Israel. That is, him being one of the, the you know, he, he being a key... <clears throat> Uh, leader who brought devastation upon Jerusalem and Judea. Uh, he was going to get a taste of that uh, in his own uh, personal life in this story. So that's Daniel chapter 4, and we remember that he was driven out to being the, among the beasts of the field from being in a place of prideful security, we might say. Uh, and that was very much like the experience of Israel. They were in a position of prideful security. They were forced to go live among the beast-like Gentile nations. Uh, but God kept the, uh, their homeland safe for them for their return to it. Um, I'd just like to uh, double down on that a little bit to um, additionally reinforce the point about this equivalence of 7 and 70, just depending on what context it happens to be in. So... Uh, if you go to Daniel 4, and this time, instead of reading when uh, Nebuchadnezzar was stricken with uh, madness uh, in uh, verses uh, 28 and following, let's just go back to 24 and read where Daniel warned him based on the dream that he had that this was in store for him. So, May, if you would read verses 24 through 27, please. This is the interpretation, interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the King, that you be that you be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place 
Be with the beast of the field, and you be given grass to eat like cattle, and be drenched with the dew of heaven, and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever, whomever mm -hmm. he wishes. And in that it was commanded to leave the stump with the roots of the tree, your kingdom will be assured to you after you recognize that it is heaven that rules. Therefore, O king, may my advice be pleasing to you. Break away now from your sins by doing righteousness and from your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor in case there may be a prolonging of your prosperity. Okay, so you'll notice that along with the warning, there was an urge for him to uh, change course, uh, maybe step away from his pride, uh, humble himself before God, do good to those who are most in need. Mm -hmm. Of course, all of this parallels the advice given to Israel. <laughs> you know, they were advised to repent before the word came on them that they would be uh, that they would be forced into exile out among the nations. So, if you remember this language, turn now, and we know that that did come upon uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar in the story we saw later. Uh, if you turn over to Daniel chapter 9 now, when Daniel is contemplating the fate of, uh, of Jerusalem and uh, Judea, and he is repenting when he uh, sort of uh, gets a fuller picture in his own mind of why this destiny has come upon them. So we won't read the whole thing, but may, if you would read verse 2, first of all, of Daniel chapter 9. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of the years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolation of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Okay, so whereas Nebuchadnezzar was driven out among the beasts for seven years, the experience of Jerusalem would be devastation for 70 years. Now, not all of those years were the people in exile, but there was a beginning of the troubles. And in fact, there was, there were progressive a couple of different times before the destruction of the city when hostages were taken back to Babylon. And the ordeal is all put into a, an approximately 70 year period. And so again, this is parallel, paralleling the small version of this that Nebuchadnezzar experienced with the seven-year loss of sanity. And if you go down to uh, Daniel reviewing just the, the, the sad fate that had fallen on the nation, if we go down to verse 7, uh, let's go ahead and read 7 and 8, please. Righteousness belong to you, O Lord, but to us open shame. As it is this day to the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all Israel, those who are nearby and those who are far away in all the countries to which you have driven them because of their unfaithful deeds which have committed against you. Open shame belongs to us, O Lord, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers because we have sinned against you. Okay, so notice that language, how... He says, um, into all the countries to which you have driven them. That was the word member to Nebuchadnezzar. You will be driven away from uh, the sons of men and have to live out with the beasts of the field. And then last week when we uh, read about the fulfillment coming, it repeated again. It says, you are being driven out um, and to uh, lose his place, to lose his mind. Now, it wasn't the case that all of the uh, men of Judah and those of Israel who'd gone into exile you know, long before under the devastation of uh, uh, the country of Assyria, it wasn't that they all literally lost their minds, but they did l lose that uh, dwelling in their own land. You know, David had said that it was, uh, it was a, a terrible fate when Saul forced him to live outside of Israel for a time and on the, on the fringes of the land of Israel, you've driven me out of the possession of the people of Israel. So that was a terrible fate. 
And even in the case of, say, Daniel and his companions, as presented in the book of Daniel, now, they are faithful to the Lord. They are not uh, committing uh, lots of sins. That we, They seem to be very anxious to keep uh, purity laws and so on. But if you would go back and read at the, uh, the beginning of Daniel, all of them have to accept and use uh, Babylonian names. You know, Daniel is given the name Belteshazzar. His three young Hebrew friends, they're all given names after Babylonian guards, you know, uh, excuse me, Babylonian gods. <laughs> that is, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Those are all, those are all names after Mesopotamian deities. And although they didn't worship these gods, they did have to go to the extent of accepting these names for their official duties and then just live in this highly, uh, you know, unholy from a standpoint of the, the purity represented by the, the God's sanctuary that had been in Jerusalem. They were in, had to live in, an, in a highly impure situation and just deal with that as best they could. And Daniel said that, you know, that it, it was appropriate for them to repent mm -hmm. so they could seek restoration. Well, as he's contemplating the prophecy of Jeremiah that the, devil, that the desolations of Jerusalem would be 70 years, there's the word in verse uh, 24 that comes as if to say, well, it doesn't say not 70, but 70 times seven. <laughs> but that's the implication. You know, the uh, angel uh, uh, comes and says, I, I believe this is still uh, Gabriel talking. He says, 70 weeks, that is 70 sevens of years are decreed on you. Now, we won't go into all the, you know, the way that that uh, worked out in fulfillment. That's a, a very long discussion about a, how that is to be interpreted. But in other words, that there might be a, a limited restoration after 70 years, but a longer period of, uh, of 70 times seven before a, uh, a more uh, complete or, uh, you know, a, a better quality uh, kind of restoring of the nation that would come. So my point is here that, uh, that the 70 here being the equivalent of the seven years, obviously it would not be practical to, to, put, to drive Nebuchadnezzar off his throne for 70 years. He wouldn't be alive, to, you know, to, to return to his throne. So it's abbreviated to 70, excuse me, to seven for him, whereas for the nation it was 70 and even a longer period that's still cast in terms of 70 or 70 times seven. So, so anyway, that makes that point. We could ask, uh, are there yet further instances of this? Because uh, I realize that, you know, at the beginning of this study, I said we would look at various instances of this pattern, 12 followed by either 7 or 70, uh, in different situations in the Bible, and then look at some that could not have been the work of a human author of the book, uh, conceivably. And, you know, that hasn't been the case with most of Like here in Daniel, I mean, you know, the, the author could have, you know, just you know, written this 12 months followed by seven, uh, you know, assuming they had that in mind, which uh, w we don't know that was the case, but that could have been done, you know, in other words, that, that wasn't a supernaturally kind of spread out occurrence of this pattern. We did see one in the New Testament. That was with the uh, only two books that contained messages to numbered what I said is numbered addressees to a certain number of recipients. That was the 12, to the 12 tribes in James, then later to the, to the seven churches in Revelation. So that's an example of where it's spread across books and a human author could not have arranged that. Certainly uh, no human author um, arranged for the way the canonization of the New Testament uh, managed to you know, put, put these books together. Just no one was in, one person was in charge of that. That's a long process. Um, but it's, it's all also important as we look at instances like that, and we will get to a, one more of those that's very key. I want to show how integral it is. And to show one that does go across books, 
let's turn back to Numbers this time. So if you're uh, following along your Bibles, go back to Numbers chapter 13. And what we have here is Israel getting ready to uh, uh, to enter the promised land, but uh, you know spies are sent into the land. Um, uh, uh, men who, or scouts, uh, uh, really, uh, because they're not actually like, going um, among Canaanites to kind of gather information that way. They're surveying the land or scouting out the land. And if we look at Numbers chapter 13, uh, May, if you would read verse uh, just verse 1 of chapter 13. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send out for yourself men, so that they may spy out the land of Canaan, which I am going to give to the sons of Israel. You shall send a man from each of their father's tribes, every one a leader among them. Okay, so to spy out, scout out the land, one man from each of their father's tribes. Now this would not include the tribe of Levi, because it wasn't a marching tribe, it wasn't an inheriting tribe, it was kind of off to the side with just special duties, it was excluded from sort of the uh, organized, uh, the normal organization of the nation did not include them. So in verses 4 through 15, we have the names of 12 men. So we have 12 of these uh, spies or scouts may have you could read verse 16 we won't read all the names these are the names of the men who Moses sent to spy out the land but Moses called Hosea the son of Nun Joshua right so uh, J Joshua has an alternate name here that's it's a very close in meaning uh, but we're focused on the fact that it was on behalf of the 12 marching tribes that scouts went into the land and there were 12 of them because he said one each mm -hmm. but it was on behalf this mission was on behalf of the 12 tribes well there is just one other but there is one other instance where men were sent to scout out the land of canaan uh, and it was not the entire land. In fact, in this case, although they went to the extreme northern part, it seems that most of, uh, we won't uh, read why here, but most of the time these scouts spent was in the southern part of the land that would be inherited by Judah. That's where uh, they get the, these, uh, um, uh, the bun bunch of grapes, you know, to show the fruitfulness of the land. But there is an important scouting expedition again for another part of the land, this time primarily the northern area, only hit lightly from what we can tell by the earlier expedition. And this is all the way over in Joshua. So we are going across some uh, books and some history here. So Joshua chapter 18. Uh, and... Uh, this again is a mission, a scouting mission on behalf of a certain number of tribes. Uh, and that's the important part. There's only two times this occurs that it's for a certain number of tribes representative from each tribe set up to be done in that way. So May, if you would, um, let's see, uh, read verses one through uh, five. Then the whole con congregation of the sons of Israel assembled themselves at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there, and the land was subdued before them. There remained among the sons of Israel seven tribes who had not divided their inheritance. So Joshua said to the sons of Israel, How long will you put off entering to take possession of the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you? Provide for yourselves three men from each tribe that I may send them, and that they may arise and walk through the land and write a description of it according to their inheritance. Then they shall return to me. They shall divide it into seven portions. Judah shall stay in its territory on the south, 
and the house of Joseph shall stay in their territory on the north. Okay, so did you get that? Uh, because seven tribes, these were seven weaker tribes, weaker than Judah, it's this large tribe for the south, weaker than Ephraim and Manasseh, the large tribes who were the primary inheritors of the northern territory of Israel. That's why it says the house of Joseph on the north. Uh, if you look at uh, again at verse 5, it's, it's describing the power tribes, Judah, the house of Joseph, that is Manasseh and Ephraim. Then there were a couple of tribes. There was a, half the tribe of Manasseh that had some land inherited on the um, east side of the Jordan and Reuben and Gad on the east side. So if you add all those up and subtract Levi anyway, you end up with seven smaller, weaker tribes that uh, that still needed to scout out their land and uh, try to uh, plan on how they could uh, take possession of it. So he says, three. so this time it's not one man from each tribe. It's how many? Three. It's three men. However, think of it this way. The first mission was delegates on behalf of the 12 tribes. This time it's delegates on behalf of seven tribes. Again, we have that pattern of the instance involving 12 and then followed later by the instance involving seven. And you'll notice they go and come. If you would read the other episode, it's longer, it's more involved, but this is just a short version of what happened earlier back in Numbers 13. But instead of bringing back a, 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 a big cluster of grapes, to bear witness as to the fruitfulness of the land, they were to bring back a book, uh, a written record that would have a description of the land, some of the borders and uh, features and so on. But in each case, there was an item of evidence that, was, that they were to uh, bring back with them as a testimony to what they saw and the nature of the land in, 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 these both, in both of these cases. So here we have uh, like I say, separate books, separate narratives, but we have the same uh, pattern emerging. All right. So last time, we also looked at, back at the table of nations in Genesis 10, the 70 nations in the Hebrew listing at least. So we had 14 uh, nations, descendants, they're mixed together. Uh, from uh, Japheth, then 30 from Ham, finally 26 from Shem, not including the line that went off uh, for the, uh, through Abraham for the Israelites, but that totals 70, and that was a catalog of the ancient world they were familiar with, the world of the ancient Near East, the 70, but standing for the entirety of mankind, standing for all of mankind. It, do, it doesn't mean that all of mankind was represented by, you know, even at that time by those 70, but they did stand for the totality of mankind everywhere on earth. And that's important because we have another instance that is um, where these numbers are implicit. So they're not strictly listed, but implied by reference. So what am I talking about? Well, go all the way to the other end of the Bible to uh, Revelation. We looked at Genesis last time, so we won't look back there. We can remember that. We, we will get back there in a minute, actually. But Revelation chapter 7, appropriately enough. <clears throat> and here, uh, I won't go into the details of why, but I believe that we are looking at a picture of the church in its final form. We have several ways that that is pictured in Revelation. We have several presentations of the church in its final form, and I believe that we get one of those in Revelation 7, uh, 4, and following. And because the order of salvation, the salvation message is to who first? To the Jews. Jew first, or Israelite, but to the Jew first, and then to the Gentile. That's how the church is pictured, in its Jewish portion first, uh, followed by its Gentile portion. It follows the pattern of, um, 
and we'll see why there aren't 70 listed here, but it's following a couple, that is, I should say, it's drawing upon a couple of Old Testament references. One is when Israel left Egypt. I think I've covered that before in, in another study that you may or may not remember that, where, where when Israel leaves Egypt in Exodus, long about chapter 12, there is a number given. It's, it's, it's a symbolic representative number, but it's, it's 600,000 and a little bit more. But, but a number is given for the men, the able-bodied men leaving Egypt. And then it says that just a, a multitude, a mixed multitude or crowd went with them, and it does not number them, but it just indicates that they were many. There were many people of other ethnicities that left Egypt with the Israelites, and that forms a pattern for how this uh, chapter proceeds to, to liken the church, you know, the fulfillment of that. So it starts out, verse 4. So, May, if you would read for us verse 4 of Revelation 7. Verse 4, only the 4. Yeah, let's just read verse 4. We won't read all these. but Okay. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sailed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Okay, and then it lists tribes, gives us 12 tribes. Uh, there's one or two, there's one left off and one. It, it's not important, really. It's, it's showing the real Israel, the true Israel. Like Paul says in Romans 9, he said, not all who descended from Israel are truly Israel. Okay, those who respond to the gospel are truly Israel. So... It's showing this Jewish part of the church first. Then uh, we get down to verse 9. May, if you'd read that. Verse 9. Mm -hmm. um, After these things, I look and behold a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. Okay. This is the, ge the, the Gentiles then that come into view. And it says no man was able to number. The number's not given in Exodus of that large mixed crowd that went with Israel. So it's not going to give us a number. It's just this, this large crowd of all these mixed uh, ethnicities, languages, and so on. But if you would notice, we heard 144,000 as the number back in verse 4 that May read. But that's because it's 12,000 times 12, uh, you know, it's 12 expanded by a thousand, sort of like seven can be expanded with 10 uh, to 70, you know, by multiplying by 10. It's 12 expanded by a thousand because these are tribes, that's, it, it, these are fruitful. It's, you know, it, it's, it's a nation uh, pictured uh, as a large number, relatively large number because uh, the church is complete and it's, 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 it's fulfilling God's uh, original purpose. But it's 12 times 12 times 1,000. That's 144,000. But the key number in it is 12. And if you we didn't read five through verses 5 through 8, but it just keeps saying 12,000, 12,000, 12, 12 times. <laughs> you know, the emphasis really is on that number 12 and its amplification. And then... It, we, we don't get a number for the multitude, but it does give us a description. May read it. All tribes, nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. Uh, so uh, it's listed four ways. Nations, tribes, peoples, tongues. If you would remember last time when we were at the table of nations, turn quick, we're, our time is just about up. Just turn back there. Maybe we can just do it really quickly. Turn back to Genesis chapter 10. So Genesis chapter 10, uh, it keeps summarizing the, the uh, descendants of the sons of Noah, and we have, it, it does it several times. May, you could read verse 5 for us. Just 10, for 5. 10, 5. From this, the coastland of the nations were separated into their lands, every one according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. And notice the four part. Land, language, or tongue, same thing. 
land, language, uh, uh, families, nations. Uh, and if you, it, it summarizes and does that as we go through for um, each of these three sons. Finally, if you turn over to 31 and 32, verses 31 and 32, just do this quickly. Um, these are the sons of shame according to their families, according to their language, by their lands, according to their nations. Notice again the four-part listing of uh, families, languages, lands, nations. And then it repeats it again, verse 32, these are the families of the sons of Noah according to their genealogies, their generations, by their nations. And out of these nations were separated. There is one other occurrence that is similar. It's only three. It's three ways of designating it. That's Daniel chapter 7, where the Son of Man is given authority over all uh, peoples, uh, tongues, and nations. It's a three-part listing. But here, the, this four-part listing is really the root, we might say, uh, a root going through the book of Daniel but ending up at Revelation. Revelation is evoking the table of nations by describing the crowd this way, as tribes, families, tongues, you know, giving us this list of their different uh, features that separate them from one another, although they're united here at the, at the end. Um, it is reminding us about the 70 nations in the table of nations. So even though the number 70 isn't there, the reference is suggestive of 70 by referring us back to Genesis 10, where the 70 nations are listed. So we might say that that 70 number representing the whole world is implied in Revelation following that either the habituation of the number 12 associated with the, the perfected Israel there. Okay, so we have a little bit more on this subject, um, but uh, that's, that's all we're going to do for now. Uh, please give us your likes, your comments, subscribe. If you're uh, just uh, joining us and you like studies, you want more of them like this, please subscribe. Let's close with prayer. Uh, Father, um, we thank you that you do hear our prayers and that you uh, uh, pay attention to our concerns and answer us uh, with your spirit of wisdom. Please guide us by your spirit till we're together again. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. And so please do join us here next time.